This message is the bride made ready. And I'm going to talk about the, the mission God has given us as a church. It's been a mission for 25 years, but I do believe God is bringing it to a brand new level in this season we're in. Uh, and even for the next decade, God's bringing it to an entirely different level. So if you have your Bibles, let's turn to Luke chapter 1. And, uh, you, you know, we have memorized this, this scripture has been read probably more than any other in our church, but it really defines the mandate God has given to us that God is raising up a John the Baptist company of vessels, ministries, messengers, anointings, that in the same way that John the Baptist prepared the way for the Lord's first coming, God is raising up a John the Baptist company of messengers, of ministries, of organizations who would also prepare the way for the Lord's second coming. And we talked about that, we sing about that in our song, even so, Lord, even so come, come Lord Jesus, come, that the bride made ready, the bride made ready. So Luke chapter 1, verse 17, we're, we're rehearsing or reminding ourselves of the, the mandate God has given to us. It's talking about John the Baptist, but I'm going to speak it over, to, over us at Restoration Life just to make it, to apply it to us is he, it is he who is going to go as a forerunner. It is he who is going to go as a forerunner before the Lord in the spirit and the power of Elijah. If you've never heard this before, I want to highly recommend on our resource library, radicalpursuit.net. Dad has a, an entire class called the Forerunner Call that you can check out. So if you're like, what is a forerunner? What is the spirit and the power of Elijah? Dad does an incredible job going into that. So I want to recommend that to you. Uh, it is he who is going to go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And so... What God is doing in this day and in this hour is he is launching a movement around the world. It's an international movement to make the bride ready. And if I had to say, okay, what is the mission God has called Restoration Life Church to? It would be to make the bride ready both locally, nationally, and internationally. God has given us a mandate. God has given us a mission to make the bride ready. That's what, that's what God has called us to. Not every church is called to that. We are called to that. That is the driving mandate God has given to us. Make the bride ready. See, in, in, Luke, or in Matthew chapter 22, Jesus was giving a parable and he said, the wedding is ready. But the bride is not. And that's where we are today. Wouldn't you agree? The wedding is ready. God is ready. But the bride is not ready. Therefore, God is moving to release forerunners with the prophetic anointing, with the jealousy of God, with the power of the Holy Spirit to be a messenger to make the bride ready. It was said about John the Baptist. I am, he was saying, I am a friend of the bridegroom. The bride belongs to him. I am a friend of the bridegroom. We want to be a friend of the bridegroom ministry, that we are not in this for ourselves. We're not in this to make a name for ourselves. We're not in this to make a big ministry or whatever, thankfully, because we're doing a good job at that. But we're not in this for ourselves. We are friends of the bridegroom. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. And we want, we, this ministry is a friend of the bridegroom ministry to make ready the bride for the bridegroom. We do not want the bride drawn to us. So many ministries and so many ministers are drawing the bride to themselves and God's bride is falling in love with the minister or the ministry rather than with Jesus. And we want to be friends of the bridegroom. 
I want to just get completely out of the way and say the bridegroom, like we sing about, the bridegroom is beautiful. The bridegroom is glorious. The bridegroom is absolutely stunning in beauty. Get your eyes on Jesus, not on a minister or on a ministry. Get your eyes on the bridegroom. Behold the bridegroom. Now, let's flip over now to Revelation chapter 9. Revelation chapter 9, verse 7. And this has also been read by our church many, many, many times. But it's the driving mandate that we have. And I want us to see the context of when Revelation 19 was spoken. It is given as a prophecy. It is given at the end of the Great Tribulation. It is given at the last three and a half years before Jesus comes back. And we know that it is the Lord has not yet returned because he's going to return in a few verses later. And so here we see that verse 7, Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Now notice it doesn't say, and God has made the bride ready. See, a lot of people think God in his sovereignty is going to make the bride ready. Now I do agree with that. I do agree with that. I do believe God is going to move in a sovereign way to accelerate his bride being made ready. But this verse is telling us there's also a dynamic to it related to the way we respond to God. The bride has made herself ready. So there is a readiness that we need that we must initiate. Well, it's really the Spirit of God that initiates it, but we respond to the prior initiation of the Holy Spirit. So we respond to God moving, and it's the bride who makes herself ready. Now, it's all by grace. It is all by the indwelling Holy Spirit. This is not about works. This is not about doing things for God, living for God, any of that. It is about you living by the indwelling life of Christ in fullness, the Spirit of God possessing you unto fullness, and Him living rather than you. But I want to say there is a role we have to play. The bride makes herself ready. The bride makes herself ready. Now, let me say this as well, that readiness is not the same thing as salvation. Most of the church, well, I don't want to say most, many in the church believe if you're saved, if you're born again, then you are ready to meet the bridegroom. And I want to say that's absolutely unscriptural. That is not scriptural. We are, when we get born again, that does not mean we are ready to meet the bridegroom. That salvation is the very beginning of the work. So I want to say it like this, is we don't get ready. Now just listen here. We don't get ready to be saved. In other words, we're not making ourselves ready to get saved. We get ready because we are saved. Does that make sense? We don't get ready to stay saved. We get ready from what Christ has finished for us on the cross. He's given us the gift of righteousness. And we get ready by what the Spirit of God has already completed on the inside of us when we were born again. When he gave us a brand new spirit... And his spirit, the Holy Spirit, the very power that raised Jesus from the dead came to dwell in your human spirit. That is, I just always just say, that is incredible. I can't get over that. The same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead now dwells in your human spirit. And he's made your human spirit righteous and complete. You are a partaker of the divine nature. Not when you get to heaven. Right now, if you're born again. And so it's from that position and that impartation of righteousness that we make ourselves righteous. That we, wor we work out what God has already worked in. 
And I, I mean, I've been on this journey for 20 something years. Dad, our leadership team, our church has been, I think we know by experience and by the scriptures, being born again and being made ready are not the same thing. It, it is a journey. It is a journey that we are on, but that is the mandate God has given to us. Now, if you look here in, in verse, verse 8, it says, It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Get this. You make your own wedding dress. Now, I know for, when I'm talking to guys, they're like, okay, that sounds miserable. I don't, no, and I've mentioned this, but no guy gets excited about the vision of seeing themselves in a wedding dress, all right? So I get that. I do not either. And if you know someone that does, they might need some counseling. But the point is this is we make our own wedding dress. In the Jewish wedding system, we've talked about this. In the Jewish wedding system, when after the betrothal ceremony take, took place, the bridegroom went away to prepare a place for the bridegroom and the bride to live, and the bride was responsible to make her own wedding dress. She could not go to Dave's bridal shop and purchase a wedding dress. She had to go stitch by stitch and make her own wedding dress. See, we are called, as the bride of Christ, we are called to work out that salvation, that divine nature, the nature and the essence of Christ. We are called to work that out into our heart and soul, into our body, into our mind, into our actions, so that the Spirit of God now begins to clothe us. Now, if we, if we do not make ourselves ready, if we do not take that initial salvation, which much of the church is doing, by the way, and we leave it and we suppress it and we live for ourselves, even though born again, then we will not have a wedding garment on that day. And so you see the necessity for the bride to make herself ready by the righteous acts of the saints, by, by what God has done for you on the cross and by what the Spirit has already accomplished in you when he, bore, when he regenerated your human spirit. And so this is really the, the theme that we see here in Revelation 19 is we see that not only does, does it not say God makes the bride ready, but the bride makes herself ready, but we also see the bride is not made ready until just prior to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Until just prior, until the three and a half years called the Great Tribulation comes to an end, then the bride is made ready. The bride is not ready right now. The bride is being made ready. And so the, the other thing we've got to understand is Jesus is not coming back. No matter how dark it gets, Jesus is not coming back until the bride is made ready. If you want to understand the end times, it is not about everything Satan is going to do. It is not about all the different calendars and Jewish wedding, Jewish feasts and all these bad things that are going to happen. Now, it includes some of that, but the main viewpoint from God's eyes is, is the bride being made ready? Is God's eternal purpose being fulfilled? Is what he intentioned before time and creation coming to completion? Jesus is not coming back until the bride is made ready. And so some people just look around and say, okay, well, this event is happening. Israel was restored in 1948, and the global government is on the rise, and it just seems like all these prophecies are being fulfilled, and there's fires going on here, and food shortages going on here, and all this stuff going on here. We're living in the end times. And I would say, yes, that's true, but Jesus is not coming back uh, at any moment because the bride's not ready. I mean, I can just look around at the church and say, I'm not ready, we're not ready. The bride must be made ready before his second coming. And so that is the mission that God has given to Restoration Life. We are to make ourselves ready 
And then we are made to make the bride ready locally, nationally, and internationally. And I even believe, I'm going to talk about this next Sunday, I even believe that God has released a movement from the throne of God. We are now in a season when the Lord himself is just do, is compelling his servants to go out and say, make the bride ready. We are living in a new prophetic season when the Lord is launching out messengers to say, make the bride ready. There is an urgent call. And I believe God is going to come right behind that call and release the overflowing abundant grace to actually make the bride ready. We are living in historic prophetic times. I'm saying this, is, this has to be one of the greatest moments to be alive. This is the church's finest hour. We are going to witness the bride being made ready, and we're going to play an important role in seeing that happen. That's not just coming down the road. It is, I'm telling you, it is right now. Right now, the bride is being made ready. Uh, the, the wedding is ready, but the bride is not. Therefore, God is sending out messengers to say, behold, the bridegroom. Behold the bridegroom, he is coming. Make yourselves ready. He's coming, he's coming. See, we've gotten so focused on the dark side of it, we've missed the glory and the beauty side of it, of the bridegroom. He's coming, he's beautiful, he's glorious, he's in love with you, and he wants to prepare you for himself. Let's turn now to Ephesians 5.27. And again, this scripture verse has defined us for many, many years. Talking about the church being made ready. And Paul's writing and he says that he may present to himself the church in all of her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. Let me say this. Sometimes we think God is going to prepare the bride once she gets to heaven. In other words, we get to heaven and then God does everything in heaven to make us ready. When Paul is actually saying the exact opposite. He's saying he's going to present to himself a church on the earth who's made herself ready. See, the church on the earth must make herself ready. And then the bridegroom comes, like we sang about. Even so come, Lord Jesus. The, the bride, in partnership with the Holy Spirit, saying, Come, Lord Jesus, come. See, the, uh, the church of Jesus Christ, though we are presently betrothed to him, like it is in the Jewish wedding system, 2 Corinthians 11, 2, we are betrothed to Jesus Christ as his bride, but we are not yet ready. And so if, if, in, in my study of the scriptures, and I've got the, the references here in the notes, but in my study of the scriptures, there's three phases of how the bride is made ready at the end of the age. And the first phase is God raises up forerunners. God raises up, and what I mean by a forerunner is a forerunner goes before the majority of the people and makes themselves ready before the majority gets ready. And so the forerunners get ready, and then the forerunners then make others ready. Does that make sense? And so the forerunners get ready before the majority, and they make the others ready. The second phase is what I call the first fruits harvest. Is before the forerunners are used to make the, the first fruits ready. And I'm looking at Revelation 12, Revelation 14. The first fruits harvest. And that first fruits harvest, I believe, is what God is moving on right now in this season to make a first fruits harvest ready. And, that, and, and again, there's a lot of scriptures here, so if you've never heard this, you're probably like, what is he talking about? There, there's stuff on this on our website. If you have questions, feel free to ask me. But 
the first fruits harvest then triggers the remaining of the bride being made ready. So we are right now in this place where God is releasing the forerunners to make the bride ready. And that the forerunners are going to trigger the first fruits harvest to make the, the, the remnant in the church ready. If you're hearing this and you like what I say, it probably means God is preparing you to be part of that first fruits harvest. And then comes the final harvest, the full in gathering. So let's turn to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2, because what I'm going to do here is I want to really talk about what it looks like for the bride to be made ready. Because it, it kind of gets a little bit confusing, okay? What does it mean for the bride to be made ready? What does that look like? You know, it can be a vague term. You know, okay, what do I mean by the bride being made ready? And so if you look at Revelation chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 3, when Jesus speaks to the seven churches, when you look at Revelation 12, 11, when you look at Revelation 14, 1 through 5, when you look at that, you can begin to see the picture of what it looks like for the bride to be made ready. And so I'm going to piece those uh, pieces together and show you what it looks like. So uh, Revelation, we're, we're just going to go from the messages that Jesus spoke to his church. The first one, the Revelation chapter 2, the church of Ephesus. A bride made ready. The bride made ready is going to have a first love for Jesus Christ. You know, the Lord told the church of Ephesus, I have this against you. You have left your first love. Now, let me say this. is we in the church, we can love the Lord, but not have the Lord as our first love. We can love the Lord, but not have him as our first love. The bride made ready is going to have Jesus as her first love. And having Jesus as our first love is far more than a good quiet time. Now, a good quiet time is important. But having Jesus as our first love means we are living by his life. We are no longer living. Like Paul said in Galatians 2.20, I am no longer living. See, a lot of the, so much of the church is still living by their own life rather than by the life of Christ that indwells them. And so because what happens is we like our life so much, don't we? We love our life, our comfortable little life. And we love the Lord, but so often we can, we can lose that first love for Jesus. You know, when we get born again, I had this, this experience a couple weeks ago. It was awesome. I, I, am, I am like the worst I am the absolute worst nightmare of a door-to-door salesman. If a door-to-door salesman comes by my house, Angie and Anna are just like, oh, God. And, you know, Angie and Anna are like, okay, Dad, be nice, be nice, be nice. But Angie and Anna were not home, and we had a door-to-door salesman. And so anyway, I walked by, and I was like, okay, yeah, I'm not even going to answer it. But he saw me, and I was like, oh, okay, i got to answer the door. So I walked up to the door, and I, my dog is just going crazy. You know, he's just barking like crazy. And I open the door, I crack open the door, and I lean in, and I'm like, I can't really open the door because of my dog. But he's like, he basically wanted to sell me some, uh, like, uh, pest control. And, you know, I was, I'm so rude to door-to-door salesmen. I probably need to repent of that. But I was so rude, and, you know, you'd normally so rude. And I was like, you know, I appreciate it, but I'm not really interested. We have somebody that already does it for us. And he stopped me and he said, he was about 22 and still in college. And he's like, do you know Jesus? And I thought, okay, first thoughts that came to my mind was, okay, does he see my flesh so bad that he's like telling me I need Jesus? Which was my first thought. And then my second thought was like, don't tell me you're bringing Jesus in to try to sell me your product. But anyway, so we start, I I said, yeah, I, I know Jesus. I'm actually a pastor. And he said, okay. He said, when I saw you, I saw Jesus. I'm like, there's no way you saw Jesus because I'm so rude to -to door-to-door salesmen. uh, I I don't know. It may have been a sales pitch. It may have been a sales pitch. But he was like, this guy, I mean, this young kid just just turned his life back to the Lord after uh, years in the party scene or whatever. And his life, I mean, he, you could just tell he was so passionate. I mean, a lot, a lot of times people don't want to hear what I have to say. Every single thing I said, he's like, man, this is so good. I just want to listen to what you have to say because I can learn from you. 
I'm like, are you being serious? I mean, are you for real? Are you an angel or is this your sales pitch? But anyway, we talked for like 30 minutes and I gave him a copy of my book and all that. And I sent him to mom and dad. I was like, you're really like them. And so I don't know how it went with you. But my point was, <clears throat> that is a sign of the end times that a door-to-door -door salesman saw that I love Jesus. Now, the point is that, that remember when we were first born again, and we just wanted to talk about the Lord, and we were so passionate about the Lord, like this young man. And, and so anyway, that's all we wanted to do, talk about the Lord and learn scripture and just talk about him and what's God speaking, what God is saying and all that. Anyway, that is what God wants us to live in that place of first love and passion, to come back to the first love. The bride made ready is going to be a bride who loves Jesus more than she loves even her very own life. It says in Revelation 12, 11, they overcame, the, the, they overcame Satan by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives. That word actually means self-life, in the soul, suke, self-life, the soul, they did not love their self, even if it meant death. In other words, God's bride is going to love Jesus more than she loves herself. I want to be that way. Man, I want to be that way. How often we love ourselves, don't we? I mean, how often we just love for what we want to be accomplished, what we want done to happen. You know, as God wants us, God wants to move us beyond our, even our self-love to love Jesus even more than that, even more than our families, even more than our ministry, even more than anything else. He wants to be that first love. And so the Lord is coming back for a bride who has Jesus as her first love. The second thing is Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, is, and I'm, just, I'm drawing from this, is the bride made ready will be faithful to the Lamb no matter the cost. Faithful to the Lord even unto death. I think of, I think of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German theologian who resisted, resisted Adolf Hitler he was the, the, such a great example of what it looks to, like to resist an antichrist government. And Bonhoeffer was in prison. Bonhoeffer was executed. But Bonhoeffer was faithful to Jesus even unto death. And I loved what he said, his last words, this is the end, but for me, the beginning of life. Bonhoeffer, not denying Jesus Christ in the face of the Antichrist government that was in Adolf Hitler, saying no matter the cost, no matter the price, I am not bowing down to the spirit of Antichrist even if it means my life. Watchman Nee is another great example. Watchman Nee, who has mentored me through his writings, for, for many, many years, Watchman Nee was imprisoned in a communist Chinese prison for like 20 years. And Watchman Nee, just his condition through the years began to weaken and weaken and weaken. And finally, he, was, he died, I think, of a heart attack at the, at the age of close to about 70 in 1972. And his grandniece went to gather his belongings and the prison guard Gave, the, gave his grandniece this letter that Watchman Nee wrote. And I, it just makes me, it gives me chills when I read this. But Watchman Nee, who was so influential, I mean, his books have impacted probably, I don't know how many millions, but millions of people. Watchman Nee said, Christ is the Son of God. This is, this is what he wrote with a shaking hand on his very, some of his very last words he ever wrote. Christ is the Son of God who died for the redemption of sinners and resurrected after three days. This is the greatest truth in the universe. 
I die because of my belief in Christ. And his grandniece said, he was faithful unto death. Watchman Nee, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, show us what it means to be faithful unto death no matter the cost. And that is going to be what is going to characterize the bride at the end of the age is no matter the persecution that comes. See, America, we have not experienced persecution. I believe that very well could be changing. And we have Bonhoeffer and Watchman Nee as examples to say, no matter the cost, we are going to uh, stand as a bold witness, as a faithful witness of the truth, no matter the cost. See, Jesus told the church in Smyrna, he says, do not, su do not fear what you are about to suffer. The devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested and you will have tribulation for 10 days. Be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. The American church has not yet been tested in that. I have not yet been tested in that, but I believe there's coming a time, I don't know when, there's coming a time when we will be tested in that area. And we've got to be those who say, like Watchman Nee, like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, is we will follow the Lamb wherever he goes. Revelation chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. is the, the, the next thing of the bride made ready is the bride will love the truth and be a faithful witness of the truth. You see, we live in an hour when we must love the truth. In fact, in Thessalonians, Paul said that God is going, listen, God is going to send a great, not, not the devil, God is going to send a great delusion upon those who don't love the truth. The bride made ready is going to love the truth. The bride made ready is not going to accept what's being pushed on us by the government. All right? Or what's being pushed on us by the brainwashing attempts. The bride made ready is going to love the truth. We're going to love the word of God. We're going to love the word of God. We're going to, just, we're going to love it so deeply to say, I want to be like the Bereans. If, who, if I'm preaching or dad's preaching or anyone's preaching, we want to be like the Bereans that say, okay, I like what you said. I don't like what you said, whatever. I'm going to go and I'm going to go into the scriptures and I'm going to search it out for myself to say, to see if what you're saying is true. See, we live in an hour in the American church when the, the, the believers don't want to be in the word anymore. We want to get it based, we want to get, we'll read blog articles or books, but we don't get into the scriptures anymore. And so that love of the truth is, is where is that love of the truth in the church? Now, I don't mean you can go to the other extreme where you love the truth and you become this heresy hunter and every single thing you do is criticize every single thing that's of the Holy Spirit or maybe not of the Holy Spirit. You become this heresy hunter. Where you, and that's not the way, that's not what God's after. God's not after that kind of love for the truth. We become grumpy and mean and that get off my lawn kind of person. That's not what God's after. God's after a love of the truth. A love of the truth that we would not only love the truth, obey the truth, but we would be a faithful witness of the truth. That was what D that, uh, Bonhoeffer, is he spoke the truth. He spoke the truth in love. No matter the cost, he spoke the truth. We're living in a time when in the governments around the world are pressuring the church slowly, but it's coming, and if we don't stand up now and speak the truth now, there will come a time when we cannot even speak the truth at all. So now is a time when we must speak the truth. We must love the truth. Now, we can speak the truth with love. We can speak the truth with grace, and we need to do both. But we must love the truth to be a faithful witness of the truth. Here's the thing, 
is you don't get into trouble until you actually speak out. If you keep your, your stu- yourself, your truth to yourself, you'll be fine. The trouble comes is when you begin to speak. Jesus would have never been crucified if he didn't speak the truth. Now, I'm not saying we go off and act stupid and say stupid things at the wrong time. I'm, we need wisdom. We need to be spirit-led. We need to know when to speak, when not to speak. We need to know, okay, okay in this given context, should I say this or should I not say this? We need to be spirit-led, but the point is, a lot of times, we just want to call it, well, we're just waiting on the Holy Spirit, and we're being silent, and God's like, no, you're not being, you're not waiting on the Holy Spirit, you're just being cowardly. You're just being cowardly. It's, It's the cowards who are thrown into the lake of fire. See, we need to be a faith, the end time church is going to be a faithful witness of the truth. And you know what? We're going to be hated because of that. Do you like your life and your comfort so much that you're willing to withhold speaking the truth so that you can be more likable by the world? Or are you willing to be a bold witness? For the truth, because the end time church is going to be a bold witness for the truth, a loving witness, a wise witness, a grace filled witness, but a lover of the truth who speaks the truth in love to a culture who does not want to hear that, to a church who doesn't want to hear it. A lot of the church does not want to hear the truth. I'm convinced if Jesus came, John the Baptist came, the two witnesses in Revelation came and and spoke in like 95% of the churches in America, they would be kicked out. They would not, they would say like, you're disrupting my system, you're disrupting my church. But the end time bride, the bride made ready will love the truth. The next one, Revelation 2.20 is the bride made ready will not tolerate the ways and the works of Jezebel. We talked a lot about that last week. But if you read the book of Revelation, there's two churches that are being raised up. There's the bride of Jesus Christ who is making herself ready. And then in Revelation 17 and 18, there's the the harlot... And those in the church playing the harlot with her, there's two brides being raised up. The bride of Jesus Christ and the harlot. The harlot is of Jezebel. The harlot has her false religion. The harlot says anything goes. There's no morality. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you look at pornography. It doesn't matter if you commit sexual sin. That doesn't really matter. That's what Jezebel is saying. And God's saying, no, the word of God is very clear. The word of God is very clear. If if looking at a woman, looking at pornography causes you to lust, pluck out your eye. Now, obviously, that does not mean literally pluck out your eye. But it means take aggressive strong resistance to that spirit of lust that wants to entrap you into that bondage. See, we cannot tolerate Jezebel. We cannot tolerate false doctrine. We cannot tolerate false religion. We cannot tolerate these things that are being promoted in the culture today, and so much of the church is drinking it. And you know what it says about Jezebel and the harlot? is that she, they, the world became drunk, the world became intoxicated by her drink. See, you drink the ideology and you drink the religion and the, the, what's being pushed by culture that's con- that is in contradiction to the Word of God, you become intoxicated, you become drunk. And the thing is, you don't even know you're deceived. Here's the thing about deception is when you're deceived, you don't know that you're deceived. Because if you knew that you were deceived, you would do something different. And so the end time church is going to overcome Jezebel. And again, if you go into dad's teaching on the forerunner call, he talks about Jezebel in that. um, Very, very important. I, I can't go into too much detail there. 
But the Lord said to the, to the church of Thyatira, he says, basically you have committed adultery with Jezebel, this false prophetess, this false teacher that came into the church and began to defile the church there. We've got to overcome Jezebel. That would include false teaching, false religion, um, anything to deal with sexual sin or perversion, that we might, the control, pride, manipulation, all of that. There's a massive, massive implications here, but we've got to overcome Jezebel. Just like Elijah confronted Jezebel, we've got to overcome Jezebel. And that Jezebel spirit is so prevalent today in our culture, like never before, like never before. The next, the next thing is the bride made ready is going to be wide awake, overcoming all forms of spiritual slumber and apathy. It's amazing to me when I read what Jesus said about the end times is how often he said, watch, wake up, stay on the alert. In fact, that word for wake up is used 22 times, but 11 times is used specifically in the context of the end of the age. In other words, Jesus is telling us there is going to be a real issue at the end of the age. The people of God are going to easily fall into to sleep. We're going to easily fall into spiritual slumber. We're going to easily fall into this place of apathy, indifference, complacency, and the thing is, when you're asleep, again, you don't even know you are asleep. God has to come and wake you up. But I, I'm saying that the, the end time church, the bride made ready, will not be like the foolish virgins in Matthew 25 who fell asleep and did not have sufficient oil to keep their lamps burning brightly in first love for Jesus. The end time church will be the, the bride made ready will be those wise virgins who have the oil of the Holy Spirit, they wake up. That's why Jesus ended that parable, Matthew 25. Wake up. Watch. Watch. You awake? Hello? The bride made ready is going to, this is Revelation chapter 3, verse 11. The bride made ready will be empowered by the indwelling spirit to persevere until the end. If you read the scripture so often, it talks about he who endures until the end will be saved. Here is the perseverance of the saints. See, Jesus was talking to the church of Philadelphia and they had overcome and Jesus was saying to them, stay faithful. Stay steady. See, a lot of us just need to hear this. What you're doing is good. Just stay steady at that for the next decade, decades until Jesus comes back. It's by the grace of the Holy Spirit that we persevere until the end. Let's, let's actually read this. Revelation 3.11 Talking to the church of Philadelphia. I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have so that no one will take your crown. See, there is a steadiness God wants to bring to the bride made ready. That she will stay under the hand of God. That she will persevere until the end, that she will say, okay, Lord, no matter what happens, I'm going to persevere until the end. The next one, the next characteristic, some of you are probably like, oh, how many more does he have to go? Uh, you know, I didn't number these, so I'm not sure. Got about 10, no, it's, all, it's getting close to being done. Getting close to John's favorite part of the message, the end. So you guys just hang in there, persevere, all right? The bride made ready, Revelation 3, 16 through 19, the bride made ready will have a fiery passion for Jesus. That's what Jesus, that's what Jesus is talking about to the church of Laodicea. Buy from me gold, gold refined by fire. 
In other words, Jesus was looking at the Laodicean church and he was saying, you are lukewarm. You are naked. You are blind. You don't even realize it. You're, you're so blind, you don't even realize it. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire that you may become rich. See, the end time church is going to be baptized in the Spirit, Holy Spirit and with fire. And the very love that the Father has for His Son, the very love that He has had for His Son before time and creation and the fellowship of the Godhead, the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Jesus said, you have loved me before the foundation of the world. That very fiery love is going to come upon the bride made ready. And we are going to love Jesus just like the Father. I don't know if there's anything better than that. Just the, the baptism of fire that we come and we are burning with passion for Jesus. God is going to give his bride a burning, holy, red-hot passion for Jesus. And that is going to burn away the lukewarmness, the self-satisfaction, the indifference, and the apathy that characterizes much of the American church. And that, that burning fire is going to then cause us to begin to respond to what Jesus said in Revelation 3.20. I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone hears my voice and opens a door, I will open the door to him, and he will come into me, and I will come into him, and we will, I'm kind of butchering the scripture, but we will dine together. We will dine together. The end time church, the bride made ready, is coming into an intimacy with the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit that is beyond anything we could ever fathom. You are invited into that. Every one of you, me, us, Jesus is saying, just like you would go when you would have lunch or dinner with friends, and when you do, it's just the most, usually, if you're not on um, Thanksgiving talking about politics with your family, usually it's an awesome flow of conversation that goes where you open up your heart, they open up their heart, and you're kind of sharing together or whatever, and you have this bonding experience together that, that unites your heart together. That's what Jesus is offering you. Jesus is offering table fellowship with you. Jesus is offering this dining relationship with you. Drew, just real quick, I felt like the Lord said that he's called you his friend. He's called you his friend. And when you were singing, I just felt like the Lord said, Drew is my friend. And he's going to reveal to you the secrets of his heart. And he's going to bring you into this dining relationship. You are, you are the, God wants me to say to you, you are the friend of God. You are the friend of God. And just wants you to know that. You are his friend. See, God is going to bring us into this dining, intimate relationship with him. An intimacy of conversations where you hear God he hears you. That is what is meant to characterize the end time church. The next one, the bride made ready is going to have the cross working in her life to the point that our self-life is crucified and we live by the fullness of the indwelling Holy Spirit. See, the cross message has been taken out of so much of the church today. We don't want to talk about the cross anymore because we're afraid it might offend some people. The, the message of the cross, and I'm not talking about what Jesus finished for us. I'm talking about the call of God that if you want to follow me, you must take up your cross, deny me, and die daily. The church has gotten away from this dying daily aspect that is, that is requ a requirement for following Christ. You cannot follow Christ if you don't die daily. I'm not saying you, I'm not saying you, you might have a bad day here or a bad day there, but I'm saying the overall thrust of your life is that you die daily. 
And I, I mentioned this earlier, but Revelation 12, 11, they love not their life even unto death. They did not love their lives. They said, we are taking up the cross. No matter the price, no matter the cost, I don't love my life so dearly. I love him more. And because I love him more, I'm embracing that cross so that I would be, like Paul said, I would be conformed to his death so that I might also have his resurrection. The next one, the bride made ready will have the nature of the lamb formed within her. Jesus is the lamb. His wife will be a lamb. His wife, the one he marries, will have his nature formed within her. Humility, meekness, love, self-sacrifice, preferring others greater than ourselves. See, when, when, uh, when in Revelation 12, 11, when it says they overcame him by the blood of the lamb, he's actually getting at not just like we say, get behind me, Satan, and we take authority over the devil. He's actually talking about they overcame the nature of Satan that was imparted through the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. See, what, what the Lord is getting at here is the nature of Satan that was imparted into the Edemic race through the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that Edemic nature of pride, self-love. See, when the Lord told, or, or when, when, uh, when the Lord, or when Satan, sorry, when Satan said to Adam, he said, you will be as gods, you will be as gods. He wasn't lying about that. That tree may, brought us to this place of self deification. There's this thing within all of us that wants to make ourself the God, the one we live by. And that's the very nature of Satan, the very nature of the dragon who said, I will cause my throne to ascend above the throne of God. See, God wants to bring that bride made ready to this place where we love him more than we love ourselves, where the nature of the lamb is formed within us, humility and meekness, self-sacrifice, love, that, the, that the, the wife of the lamb will herself be a lamb, that we would have his nature and conformity into his image. Two more, and then we'll close, and I'll go quick. The bride made ready will have clean hands and a pure heart. There is such a need today for clean hands and a pure heart in the church of Jesus Christ. For God's refining fire to purify our heart, purify the deepest things internally, our motives, our ambitions, what we think about, to purify us, that we would not even have any bit of pride or lust or rebellion or unforgiveness or bitterness, selfish ambition, judgment in our heart. It's the pure in heart that will see God. God, may God give us clean hands and a pure heart. May God give us clean hands and a pure heart. God is going to bring holiness back into his church. We don't like that word anymore because we've seen the negative side effects of some who went off the, off the rails in the area of holiness, but God's holy. God's beautiful. That doesn't mean like your life's boring. It means you are becoming like Christ. You are being filled with his love, his joy, his goodness, his faithfulness, his character, his meekness. And finally, the bride made ready. Oh, actually, I have one more after that. <laughs> I'm just introducing you into eternity, what it's like to live through eternity, okay? So you got you to get used to it at some point. This is like eternity, okay? <clears throat> the bride made ready will live in moment-by-moment -moment reliance and absolute obedience to the indwelling Holy Spirit. 
They follow the lamb wherever he goes. There is no agenda. There is no, I'm not saying you don't plan. We obviously need to plan. But we're not scheming and creating in our own soulish experiences. We're being led by the voice of God in our spirit. Lord, what do you want to do? What do you want to say? What is the Spirit doing? What is the Spirit saying? They follow the Lamb wherever He goes. I want to be that way. That's a challenge. That is a challenge. In other words, the Lord would say, don't say this right now. And we just want to say, we just want to speak what, God, what we want to say, don't we? We want to just give our opinion or even give what God has revealed to us. And the Lord's like, don't say it now. Or he might be saying, say this now. Or he might say, don't go here, go there. Or he might say, don't take this job, take that job. Well, I mean, it could be a, a million different things. But the bride made ready will follow the lamb wherever he goes. And then finally, the bride made ready will have lips that only speak the truth. Lips that only speak the truth. Just like Isaiah, when he was caught up into the throne room, and the angel flew to him and cleansed his lips with fire, the bride of Jesus Christ, her lips are going to be cleansed from fire, or cleansed by fire, so that therefore we don't gossip about our brother or sister. We don't judge them unrighteously. We don't accuse them. We don't accuse us. We don't, vo we don't give a place to the accuser of the brethren to allow us to be a prophetic oracle of darkness speaking over our brother and our sister what the devil is saying about him, them. Is we have our lips restrained. Now again, that doesn't mean you don't deal with issues. It doesn't mean you don't speak about certain things in certain contexts. But this idea that we're not speaking against our brethren in Christ, that we're not judging them unrighteously, that we're, we're discerning and we're judging by the Spirit of God. May he baptize our lips in fire. See, I think when you see what it means for the bride to be made ready, you realize we have quite a long ways to go, don't we? I do. I mean, I'm reading and, you know, hearing all this. I'm like, gosh, I'm getting convicted about this. I'm getting convicted about that. I mean, don't you see salvation and readiness are not the same thing. It's the working out of salvation that makes us ready. And so our mandate as a church, our mandate locally, nationally, and internationally is to be that voice wherever God gives us influence, wherever God would give you influence, to be made ready and to make others ready because I'm telling you, the days of his coming, and I'm going to talk about this next Sunday, the days of his coming are going to be accelerated by a church that makes themselves ready. And so we say to conclude this message, John, I'm at your favorite point, this is no more. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Amen. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and end the online portion here. And uh, let's, let's stand and respond to the Holy Spirit. I know he's been doing quite a number of things today. If you say yes to this...